It's a great pleasure to be able to take part in this conference on tea, its history, culture, its role in society between the 17th and 19th centuries. And I want to talk to you today about uh, one particular insight that comes from uh, the study of the collections here at the Oak Spring Garden Foundation. I first came across the name of John Bradbury Blake in the collections of the Linnaean Society. My interest then was uh, ginkgo. I was uh, fascinated to learn a little bit about Blake from, from my research, but I, I thought no more of it until I came to the Oak Spring Garden Foundation here in Northern Virginia, and to my astonishment found that in the library here, created by our benefactor, uh, Rachel Lambert Mellon, was a huge archive of Blake materials, which includes uh, not only a large number of exquisite uh, uh, illustrations of Chinese plants, but a substantial archive too, uh, that includes his notes, his letters, uh, and a whole variety of materials that give us a glimpse into the life of John Bradbury Blake. We made this the, the focus of our first research meeting here at the Oak Spring Garden Foundation back in May 2017. And a group of us have been working on this archive now for about five years. Uh, Josepha Richard, who I think you'll hear from, and the project coordinated by Jordan Goodman and myself. So here is uh, the timeline of John Bradbury Blake. His father was born in the early 18th century. He himself was born in 1745. His father probably made a good deal of money uh, for the British East India Company as part of the East Indi British East India Company during his time in India. But John Bradbury Blake himself, when taken on by the British East India Company, first went to Canton in say, 1767 and 1768, and then after arriving back in London, turned around almost immediately and went back to Canton in October 1768 for uh, about five years, and he died there in November 1773. Uh, for me, uh, uh, it was fascinating to uh, get this insight into what was going on in Canton at that time, because as a former director of Kew, of course, I was very familiar with the pagoda uh, at Kew, constructed by Sir William Chambers right around this time, about 1761 for Princess Augusta. And Chambers himself had been on three voyages to China with the Swedish East India Company between 1740 and 1749. And among the early connections with China at Kew is this wonderful ginkgo tree, planted at around the same time the pagoda was built, about 1760. During the time that John Bradbury Blake uh, was in Canton, he was operating under what was known as the Canton system, which came uh, into being between about 1720 and 1760 as a response of the Chinese to perceived political and commercial threats from abroad. Basically, the Canton system required that foreign traders interacted with only the Hong merchants uh, in Guangzhou. Their contact with the rest of China was extremely limited. And they, uh, when the ships were not in, they went back down to the mouth of the Pearl River Delta uh, in Macau. Uh, this shows you uh, at around the time of John Bradbury Blake, uh, the so-called factories. These are really warehouses of the Swedish, British and Dutch East India companies. John Bradbury Blake's main occupation revolved around tea. He was a trader. Most of what was being traded or what was being exported uh, through the ships of the British East India Company was indeed tea. And as this quote from Jessica Hanza makes clear, uh, around about the time that Blake was there, an enormous amount of tea was being imported into Britain. But Blake had another interest. He was fascinated not just by tea, but by a whole range of plants. And he was interested in discovering these Chinese plants, trying to send them back in a, as he might have called it, a vegetative state back to Europe alive. Uh, and he was also interested in documenting the plants that he came across during his time in Canton and Macau. And his work there was relatively well known. Uh, he sent materials to his father, based in London. His father then distributed the materials to growers in England, but also growers overseas. So, for example, Henry Lawrence 
one of the signatories to the American Declaration of Independence, writing in 1773, he was a plantation owner just outside of Charleston in South Carolina, mentioned specifically Mr. Blake with the aid of his son, introducing uh, many things from China that might be beneficial to the Carolinas. So the archive at the Oak Spring Garden Foundation consists of about 176 drawings of about 138 species, 100 genera or so, including not only Chinese plants, but plants that had already come into that part of the world from, from other areas. For example, these chili peppers that almost certainly came from Peru across the Pacific into the Philippines and up into Canton. The accuracy of these illustrations is really quite astonishing. So to contrast these two different images of rice, you can see all of the features that today modern rice experts use to separate different varieties of this critically important plant. And he was a grower too. So in addition to doing these illustrations, this is an illustration of the Chinese tallow tree, which now uh, is an aggressive weed actually in the, the Carolinas. He was growing these plants from seed. But who was making the illustrations? In this uh, short paper uh, by Ellis, published in 1773, right around the time that John Bradbury Blake died, which was encouraging people to bring back seeds in a living state from foreign plants. He mentions uh, Blake specifically and says that Mr. Blake has now in his employ two eminent Chinese artists to paint all the valuable plants of that country in their proper colours, both in flower and fruit. So here is the image of tea among the uh, Bradbury Blake uh, images. And I show it to you uh, in some detail here so that you can see the extreme care that Blake took in the accuracy of his illustrations. He notes, for example, the number of stamens. He illustrates the stamens at life size and they're magnified. He notes uh, the number of petals. So these illustrations were done uh, with great accuracy and I think with a very close collaboration between Blake and his several Chinese artists. If one looks at the drawings of the capsules of the tea plant, you can see that their outlines are in pencil. Again, there's great uh, uh, detail. I think that some of this uh, artistry was done by Blake uh, in close collaboration with his artists. You see these pencil outlines too uh, around the leaves of this uh, tea plant. And tea was one of the plants that he was growing. Here is his illustration of a one-year-old tea seedling. It says, painted the second week of February 1772, full size from a plant of one year's growth. And then you see the Chinese calligraphy and the transliteration. So who was John Bradbury Blake? He was wealthy and well-connected through his father. He was well-educated he was an accomplished and meticulous observer. He was talented, probably artistically talented, certainly with a good eye, including for botanical details, and with a special interest in plants. He was interested in botanical documentation, but also the practice of growing plants and trying to send the plants back to Britain and its colonies. And he was inquisitive not only about plants, but about many other aspects of Chinese culture, although plants were his main focus. So was John Bradbury Blake a colonial biopirate? Well, in some senses, perhaps yes, but the breadth of his inquisitiveness belies the notion that his botanical motivation was solely exploitative. His aspirations were probably not too different from those of many young people today, a desire for financial security or success combined with a striving for personal satisfaction and recognition. He was distributing these seeds uh, to uh, back, as I said, to his father, who was sending them to various uh, growers. Uh, and you see in this table, they were keeping track. So the list of plants is down the left hand side and then across the top, the institutions or individuals to which those plants were being sent. The Blakes did, however, have a financial uh, interest. They were using the money they already had to make money rather than trying to make money out of the plants that Blake was so interested in. As Jessica Hans has pointed out, the tea trade was a capital intensive business 
and the Hong merchant intermediaries, who were intermediaries between the upcountry growers and the tea merchants and suppliers and manufacturers and the traders, also needed money to bridge the loans to acquire the materials that they could sell to the traders. The Blakes, John Bradbury Blake, perhaps on behalf of his father, was loaning money to these Chinese merchants at predatory rates. This uh, article from Jessica Hanzer, which was in that first symposium volume that we did on Blake, uh, indicates that, that he was uh, lending money at a 24% annual interest rate. And long after John Bradbury Blake had died in 1779, the East India Company reported that Mr. Blake was still owed £5,490 uh, by Kershaw and that the debt was under the management of a brokerage firm in Canton. So John Bradbury Blake was certainly an interesting person. Uh, of all of these traders, many of the traders would have had an interest in plants. They all certainly would have been interested uh, in tea. But Bradbury Blake was interested in a much wider range of plants. Tea was certainly part of his life, but not the main focus, I would suggest, of his scholarly attention while he was based in Canton and Macau.